Great Smoky Mountains, July 2014. My name is Joshua, and I want to share with you a story about a strange encounter I had in the beautiful Great Smoky Mountains National Park. You see, I've always been fascinated by the mysteries of the wilderness there, so I often find myself exploring its wonders. This time, my adventure took me deep into the heart of the park. It was a sunny morning in July of 2014, and I had set out on a hike along the Trillium Gap Trail. The trail wound through dense forests, beside sparkling streams, and past towering mountains. I was hoping to catch a glimpse of some elusive wildlife that called the park home. Little did I know that I was about to encounter something beyond my wildest dreams. As I made my way through the trail, I felt a mix of excitement and anticipation. Suddenly, a rustling noise caught my attention. I stopped in my tracks, trying to locate the source of the sound. I looked around. Nothing was there. But then, I saw it. A creature unlike anything I had ever seen before. It stood tall, with dark fur covering its entire body. Its large, muscular frame reminded me of the legendary Sasquatch. At first, I felt a surge of fear shoot through my veins. My heart raced and my breath quickened. I had heard stories about mysterious creatures lurking in these woods, but I never expected to come face to face with one. However, as I observed the creature more closely, I realized that it didn't seem aggressive or threatening. Instead, there was this sense of calmness and curiosity in its eyes. The encounter took place near a clearing not far from the trail. I cautiously took a step closer, hoping to get a better look. The creature, seemingly unbothered by my presence, remained still, watching me with an air of intrigue. I could hardly believe my luck, a -a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to study a creature from the realms of myth. Overwhelmed with a surge of curiosity, I decided to take a chance and try to communicate with the creature. I spoke softly, introducing myself and expressing my fascination. To my astonishment, the creature seemed to understand me, and it responded with a series of deep, rumbling sounds that almost resembled words, but I couldn't decipher their meaning. As the minutes turned into what felt like an eternity, the encounter between myself and the creature continued. We communicated in our own unique way, sharing a connection, and somehow talking to each other. It felt as if we were two beings from different worlds, but meeting briefly in this hidden corner of the park. During our interaction, a second person came upon the trail. It was an elderly hiker who had been exploring the park too. I watched as he approached, and he finally saw what was going on. He then stood there in awe, witnessing the extraordinary encounter unfold before his eyes. He remained silent, understanding the significance. But he had no direct relationship with the creature or me. Eventually, we both watched as the creature retreated into the depths of the forest, disappearing as mysteriously as it had appeared. The hiker and I were left standing there, awestruck and filled with wonder. The encounter had definitely left an indelible mark on us, and we knew that life would never be the same. The man continued on his journey. I watched him as he walked off. He told me what an extraordinary experience it was for him, and that he was going to ponder how to move forward with the information. As for me, I couldn't help but feel a mix of joy and sadness joy for having witnessed something truly extraordinary, and sadness knowing that many people won't believe my story. As I made my way back along the trail, my mind filled with thoughts of the creature. It hadn't acted wild towards me, like bears that I've encountered in the past. It displayed a gentle and curious nature, leaving me with a sense of awe rather than fear made me question the assumptions I had about untamed wilderness and the unknown creatures that might inhabit it. Ultimately, this encounter ignited a newfound passion for me, for the mysteries of nature. I started then to dedicate myself to learning more about unknown creatures, creatures that might inhabit our world. 
I also began volunteering at wildlife conservation organizations, supporting efforts to protect and preserve the habitats of any magnificent creature that might live in our midst. Thanks for letting me share my brief but incredible encounter. Jacksonville, Florida, March 2007. It was late March of 2007 when I saw it. You probably wouldn't believe me if I told you. It's just that I've got to share it with somebody. Anybody. I figured maybe if more people knew about it, well, maybe someday there might be some real answers. That has to count for something. It might one day even save some lives. Who knows? Maybe they'll collect other encounters about it. So, here goes. I was just a kid when it happened. We were in the middle of soccer practice. It was a late, sunny afternoon, but nothing too blinding. This was back when I was still dreaming of going to Berkeley. One of my teammates kicked the ball really hard. I started for it, but the ball sailed straight over my head and out of the park, across the street, and into a cluster of tightly woven trees. It was weird it would land there because most of the land around the park was grassy and open. But I just dismissed it, and I glanced from side to side in case there was any incoming traffic. The streets surrounding the park weren't overly busy. I watched as one car, a common sedan in navy blue, passed by. Everybody was impatient for me to get the ball, and so I just shrugged and crossed the street. I could see greenery to my right. And as I jogged across the hot pavement, that's when I saw it. My teammates were much too far away to see anything, but right behind the ball, something was moving. Something big. I honestly thought it was a stray dog at first. Anyone would have if they had seen it too. The dark, fluffy head of rust-colored fur could have easily belonged to a Malamute or even a long-haired German Shepherd. It could have even been a cross of the two, I suppose. I watched as the canine's nose wrinkled up and down, taking in each of the scents of the soccer ball. I watched in fascination as it continued to lean closer. And since I liked dogs, I stupidly called over to it, thinking it was friendly. But that's when it happened. The dog glanced up at me, and it began to stand up on its hind legs. I remember the impossibly long shadow as it fell over me. This thing must have easily been twice my size. Whatever its true height was, I was scared, and I'm not exactly the type that's scared easily. Yet in that moment, I could feel the blood drain from my skin as the dreaded creature stared me down with soul-piercing gaze. The yellow eyes were burning embers of something. Something almost human was staring straight through me, almost like it was judging whether or not to let me go. I couldn't pry myself away, its gaze was absolutely mesmerizing, and there was a dangerous sort of intelligence reflecting back from deep within its eyes. Something far older and much more mysterious than its furry predecessors. I stayed where I was for what seemed like a long time. There really wasn't anywhere I could go, to be honest. I wasn't sure how fast the creature could run, but I was willing to bet that it was a lot faster than me. I was in good shape. I was a kid, but with legs that long, there was no way I could even stand a chance. The thing's stride had to have been more than likely two to three times mine, and I would imagine it closing the gap between us in a mere heartbeat. The creature then let out a low, guttural growl. It rumbled out like a curious warning, but it didn't sound anything like a dog should have sounded. It was almost like there were two different vocal cords. And whatever that thing was, it didn't like me. Now that was fine with me, I didn't much like it either. I couldn't tell its gender in the shadow between the cluster of trees, but it didn't really matter. I bravely reached out with my trembling arm and I pointed toward the ball. And then I watched as the thing used one of its massive clawed paws with nails, reach out, and gave a mighty swing. The ball shot out like a slingshot, I immediately made a dash for it. As I moved, I kept a close eye on the thing and watched at the same time as the ball sailed high over my head. 
and then it landed. The ball bounced once, and it shot forward into the grassy area. I was breathing hard as I picked it up, and then, in sheer curiosity, I turned to glance once more at the beast. To my great surprise, it was already gone. I scanned the horizon for any sign of life, but there was none. My teammates were now shouting loudly from somewhere behind me, and yet I had not paid them any attention. I was too wrapped up in my own thoughts. Eventually, I gave up on the hopes that I might one day see that thing again. Whatever it was, it was long gone. I hurried and took the soccer ball back to my teammates where I immediately shared the story with them. They all looked at me like I was crazy. I kind of thought I had lost it too there for a moment. They figured I was just making an excuse for why it took me so long. In the end, I never did see that thing again, although I went back a few times to that same soccer field and looked. Maybe it was just passing through the area, like some sort of a wandering gypsy. After all, I now believe that anything is possible. Though I think the real question is, what does everybody else think? Newark, New Jersey, September 2019. I had been working at PATH, the Port Authority Trans-Hudson Rail System, for about four years at that point. The network is further out than the central lines of the New York subway, which I had also worked on a few years earlier, but this line was no less full of problems. It seemed like every day my engineer buddies and I would be called out to fix some fault or adjust some rail that was malfunctioning. It wasn't exactly the greatest job, but it paid well, and if you had the right crew with you, it could be a decent gig, and you could enjoy some laughing as you worked. That wasn't to say that sometimes it wasn't creepy, especially if you're working sections on your own. Sometimes it did feel really weird down there. You would step off the platform where everything was nicely lit and the people were just standing around waiting for the next train. And then you would step into and hit this sort of barrier. Most times I didn't think about it. I would just bang on my headlamp and stroll merrily into the tunnel But recently, close to the time that I saw what I saw, I had become a lot more nervous about it, a lot more aware. It didn't help that a few weeks earlier I had read an article about the dogs in the Russian subways. A few genetics guys had shown how, over time, breeding dogs for their friendliness to man resulted in other side effects, where those same dogs passed on traits of being cuter, more juvenile looking, and having shorter muzzles. They also proved that the opposite was happening in the subways. Dogs in the tunnels that were living as scavengers had stopped showing traits that separated them from wolves. Their snouts were getting longer, and they were becoming more muscular and aggressive and far less trusting of man. Packs of these feral creatures were apparently roaming parts of the Russian subway system and I guessed it wouldn't be long until they were stalking around over here. Many of my co-workers had reported hearing growls and scratching noises in the tunnels. One had even seen a shadow of a dog moving along one of the inside walls. We took it so seriously that there were notices about it in the break room. Any sightings of dogs in the tunnels was to be reported. You'd better believe I reported mine. I was going to work on a signal switch that had been failing. It was a one-man job, and even though we were supposed to go out in pairs, I gave Cameron an early lunch break so that he could catch the game. I told him I could handle the job myself. No sooner had I crossed that threshold out of the light and into the dark of the tunnel than I knew it was a mistake, and I wished that he was there with me. There was a sound in there, some kind of a low rumbling that sounded like an animal or something up towards the other end of the tunnel. I looked back over my shoulder to the light that I had left behind me, and now I was a good 200 feet into the tunnel and the light looked like a little disc, far away in the distance. The further I got from that disc, the less safe I felt, and the louder the sound became. Now it's difficult in those echoey tunnels to judge exactly where a sound is coming from, but after a few more steps, when the noise, definitely a growl, seemed to get louder, I decided that the signal outage could wait. I turned and I started heading back toward the light, 
toward the disc that marked the opening of the tunnel, and for me, safety. And that's when I heard the growling, clear and unaltered by the echo, directly to my left. Slowly, I turned toward the sound, and I saw what made it. In the time since this happened, I've had numerous people tell me it was just a dog, that because I had only seen it by the light of my headlamp for a few seconds before I panicked and ran, they said I'd only seen a flash, and that my mind was terrified and filled in the blanks. But that's not true. I know what I saw, and it wasn't a dog. If anything, it looked like some kind of a cross between a dog and a man. From my lamp, I just caught a glimpse of its snout and the teeth hanging under those horrible yellow eyes. The points of the pupils were tiny and they almost disappeared because of the brightness of my light. It's hard to explain, but even though it was an animal, or it looked like an animal, the way the skin and the fleshy parts around the eyes that weren't covered in hair folded and wrinkled in on themselves, that was human, like a human face. There was expression in its eyes too, and the creases around them. You could read the expression and the emotion that it was showing. At the moment that I flashed my light onto the thing, the expression was rage. The thing then moved towards me, and there was a flash of shaggy gray fur. Judging by where the face was positioned and how far below the ground would have been, this thing must have been standing well over seven feet tall. That is no dog. I screamed and I hurtled toward the other end of the tunnel, never looking back once, and hoping, praying, that whatever it was hadn't chased me. In my report to the company, I did not write about a dog sighting. I said as clear as day that I had seen a dog man. I handed in my report at the same time that I handed in my notice. My co-workers say that there has been no further message of any of it, and needless to say, I've never been back in those tunnels, and I no longer ride the subway. Yosemite National Park, June 2019. My name is Blake, and I want to tell you about an incredible encounter I had in Yosemite National Park. I'd been on a hiking and camping vacation with my family. It was a yearly event for us. This year was Yosemite and it was a sunny morning the day that this happened. We had started our hike from a trailhead at the base of the mountains. I remember the air being fresh and the sound of chirping birds filling the air. We followed a winding trail that led us deep into the heart of the park. At one point, as we made our way up a steep path, my eyes were darting everywhere. I was on the lookout for signs of animals or anything out of the ordinary. But little did I know that I was about to encounter something truly extraordinary. With all my excitement, I was in the lead and moving more quickly than the rest of the group, by quite a bit of distance, I might add. At one point, I reached a clearing and I started walking towards the center. While I was making my way there, I glanced across the clearing towards the trees on the other side. And suddenly, I froze in my tracks. Standing behind one of the trees, half covered by shadows, about 50 feet away, was a creature that resembled a human, but one that was covered in hair. It was enormous, and as I looked, I could see the face of a dog, and shaggy brown fur, and long muscular arms. But the creature's eyes were wide and curious, and it stood on two legs just like a human. At first, fear washed over me and my body felt like it was glued to the ground. But as I studied the creature, I realized that it didn't seem aggressive or dangerous. In fact, it looked just as surprised to see me as I was to see it. The encounter lasted for what felt like an eternity, but it was probably only a few minutes. We stood there locked in a gaze as if trying to understand each other. As I stood there staring at the creature in awe and disbelief, I couldn't help but notice its immense size. It's all I could think about. It must have been at least eight feet tall and towering over me like a giant. The creature's body was covered in thick, dark brown fur, which blended perfectly with the surrounding trees and the foliage. 
Its muscular arms hanging by its sides almost touched the ground. At first, my heart raced with fear. The stories I had heard about Bigfoot creatures flashed through my mind, but as I observed the creature more closely, I noticed that it had a gentle expression in its large, round, dark eyes. It seemed curious rather than threatening. The creature then took a step forward, cautiously closing the distance between us. I held my breath, unsure of how it would react. To my surprise, it didn't move any closer. Instead, it just stood there, tilting its head slightly as if trying to understand my presence. Feeling a mixture of fear and fascination, I decided to take a small step backward, hoping to create some distance between us. To my relief, the creature mirrored my movement, showing no signs at all of aggression. It was as if it understood my intentions and didn't want to scare me away. We continued this slow dance, taking turns, stepping back, and observing each other. It was a surreal experience, to say the least. Like being part of a silent conversation between two beings from different worlds. I did feel a sense of connection, a bond formed through our mutual curiosity, and the forest around us was hushed, as if holding its breath creating an atmosphere of enchantment and mystery. It felt like I had entered a different realm, a place where mythical creatures roamed freely. Clearly, my imagination was running wild with this encounter. But despite the fear still lingering within me, I couldn't help but feel a sense of joy. And then with a final glance at the creature, I slowly turned around with my heart pounding in my chest. I then made my way back to where my family was still working their way up the trail. My mind was racing with a mix of emotions. I couldn't wait to share my encounter with them and to describe in vivid detail what had just happened. As I talked, they could see the truth in my eyes. I recounted every detail, from the creature's appearance to our silent communication. They listened intently, hanging on every word. Some were amazed. Others were skeptical. But then as a group, we all continued back up to the clearing, but despite all of us looking around, we found no further signs of the creature. The rest of the day passed by in a blur. We concluded our hike as we planned, reaching our campsite just before the sunset. Emotionally, each family member had a different response to my encounter. Some felt a sense of wonder. Others felt a lingering unease a reminder of the unknown that can lurk in the forest. But we all agreed that it was a day we would never forget. And for me, a day that has affected me deeper than I ever could have imagined. Minnesota, 2010. Midway through the year of 2010, I began hanging out again with my high school friend, Ian. We had dated in the past and we were now just friends but I kept thinking it might turn into more again, so I was really putting in the time to see him as much as possible. I was living in Minneapolis at the time, and I was making weekend trips over to visit him every few weeks or so in St. Cloud, nearly always ending up spending most of the day on Sunday hanging out until the last minute, and then I'd be driving home late at night. After one such weekend getaway, it had started raining while I was driving back and the roads were glistening from the rain, and visibility was tough. My eyes were definitely tired and glassy when I finally got off my exit, and I kept having to blink them to focus the last few miles. Finally, I pulled up to my apartment complex just after 11, and I parked in my parking spot next to the wall that butts up against the highway. I turned my car off, grabbed my black and gray striped umbrella, and headed towards my apartment and the sidewalk to my front door, pulling my small wheeled suitcase in tow. About halfway to the door, I realized that I might have forgotten my wallet on the seat of the car, since I had to take it out to pay tolls. I turned around and took a few steps back towards the car, frustrated that I had to do it in the rain. I was also thinking about how late it was, and how cold it still was, when suddenly something ran out in front of me, across my path, and blocked me. I stopped in my tracks. I didn't know what it was at first, 
and I was petrified as I stood there listening to its heavy breathing and moans. The rain was coming down harder now, and I was blinking through it, trying to focus on what this thing was. It was also standing right between me and a streetlight, which backlit the thing, making it hard to see more than just its silhouette. What I do know is that standing in front of me was the most insane thing I have ever seen. It was between seven and nine feet tall, just massive, with dark fur all over its body. And it had two arms like an ape. And when it stood up, the best way I can describe its face is that it looked like a cross between a monkey and a human, with deep-set eyes and very long fingers. The outline of its body was similar to the shape of a human, and it stood there on two back legs that seemed bent in this crazy position, with its hands hanging to its sides, nonchalantly, blocking the path back to my car, sniffing around in the air, too. It was so strange because I don't even know if it knew I was there by the way it just kept swinging its head around and sniffing, and it didn't care one bit that it was getting soaked. It didn't look uncomfortable at all. I stood there wide-eyed as this thing seemed to not have a care in the world, but somehow wanted to block me, toy with me. And after a very short time, it let out a deep growl and slowly brought its arms up to the front of its chest, looked me right in the eyes, and then let out this long, bone-chilling screech. And that snapped me back to reality. I screamed back at it. I have no idea why I did this, but I dropped my suitcase and I started waving my arms wildly at it. I think I reacted as if it was a bear, which is something most people from Minnesota know how to do if they encounter one. It's almost like my brain calculated that this huge beast was a bear and instinctively made me act as if it was. And then I started shouting. I don't even remember what I shouted at it, but I do recall yelling something like, back up, go away, over and over. I wasn't sure if it could understand words, but as soon as those came out of my mouth, both of its arms dropped to its side, and it turned quickly, as if someone had said a magic word, but a magic word that sent it into a fit of rage, as its face contorted and twisted. After more screaming and hissing on its part, it galloped off into the darkness between two buildings across from me making this god-awful sound like nothing I've ever heard before. All I can say is that we don't have anything here in Minnesota that even remotely is similar to this sound, and I can't really describe it as other than saying it made every hair on my body stand straight, and it made me feel sick to my stomach. I've never had a feeling like that before, and I don't think I will ever forget it as long as I live. As soon as it was gone, the chills went up and down my spine, and not knowing if it would come back at any second, I bolted towards my apartment building. I ran as fast as I could. I reached the door, and then I turned, and I looked, watching the space where it had run off, and I slammed the door behind me. I made it inside, and I locked all three deadbolts before my knees buckled, and I collapsed on the floor. And then the sobs came out of me for what felt like an hour straight. After a bunch of crying, I told myself to get it together. And I headed over to the computer to try to figure out what had just happened. What I had seen. It was late, but there was no way I would be able to fall asleep. My body was still pumping adrenaline like crazy. I sat down at the computer and I typed the words, Hairy Animal That Stands on Back Legs. And up popped, immediately the word dogman, and a detailed description. The dogman is an upright walking, short-haired, muscular creature that stands on its back legs, sometimes with the palms of its hands facing forward. It has a dog or wolf-like head and long canine teeth which are larger than a normal human being's. They've been known to kill both animals and humans for no apparent reason, although it's highly unlikely. They walk very fluidly on their back legs, with good speed, and a horrible smell may accompany it. I just sat there, staring at the screen in shock. I feel it was a miracle that it never touched me or hurt me, and that it just headed off after scaring the crap out of me. Ian and I talked about it, and he told me to keep it to myself. 
He didn't want anyone thinking I was crazy. I'm so glad he believes me, though. And if you were there, you would certainly think so, too. There's just no way to deny it. But to be clear, there's nothing positive about the encounter. And it's still very real and raw to me, even though it's been over 12 years. It was a scary night for sure, and I would love to tell you that I haven't gone outside after dark since then, but that's totally impossible. What I can tell you, though, is that I now always carry a can of mace, and I've never again forgotten to check for my wallet before getting out of my car. Outside Nashville, Tennessee, 2019, I was on a road trip with my friends through a remote stretch of countryside. We were driving from Nashville to Manchester, Tennessee, late into the night on our way to a weekend music festival. We were excited and enjoying the freedom of the open road. As we cruised along the deserted highway, a sense of unease began to settle in. Each one of us sensed it. The atmosphere seemed different, and even the lights seemed to be flickering differently. It also felt as if something was watching us from the shadows. We dismissed it as mere paranoia, blaming it on tiredness and the isolation of the surroundings. Little did we know, our skepticism was about to be shattered. As our headlights pierced through the darkness, we rounded a bend as they revealed an iridescent, almost glowing figure standing motionless by the roadside. The sight of it sent a jolt of adrenaline through our veins, causing our hearts to pound in our chests. We couldn't tear our eyes away from the sight of it. It captivated and horrified us all at once. The reptilian creature towered over us with its scaly body shimmering under the glow of the headlights, and its skin appeared weathered, ancient, wet like a relic from a primordial era. Every movement it made was deliberate and precise as if it were a master predator assessing its prey. The creature's head resembled that of a fearsome dinosaur with a long snout adorned with rows of serrated teeth, and its slitted, fiery eyes glowed with an otherworldly intensity, seemingly reflecting the depths of a sinister intelligence. The air grew colder, as if its mere presence sucked the warmth from our surroundings. Frozen in fear, we watched as the reptilian creature shifted its weight, its muscles rippling beneath its scaly exterior, and the moonlight cast eerie shadows across its frame, emphasizing the power and the menace it possessed. We were acutely aware of our vulnerability, trapped in the confines of our vehicle with this creature from the depths of a legend. Suddenly, the creature emitted a chilling hiss, its elongated tongue flicking out between its sharp teeth. The sound seemed to reverberate through our very souls, filling the night with an undeniable sense of dread. Summoning every ounce of courage, I slammed the car into reverse, tires screeching against the asphalt, adrenaline coursing through our veins as we raced backward, putting distance between ourselves and the creature. The creature then let out a piercing screech, a sound that would haunt our nightmares for years to come. As we sped away, the creature disappeared into the shadows, its presence lingering in the air like a threat. Our hearts pounded in our chests. The gravity of the encounter was sinking in as we realized the enormity of what we had just witnessed. We had come face to face with an entity that defied all logical explanation. Word of our encounter spread like wildfire, drawing attention from paranormal enthusiasts and skeptics alike. Some dismissed our story as a fabrication, an elaborate hoax designed to generate attention. Others, however, listened intently, sharing their own encounters with reptilian beings and validating our experience. In the aftermath, we found ourselves grappling with a profound sense of awe and terror, the encounter shattered our perception of reality, leaving us with more questions than answers. We delved into research, seeking accounts of similar encounters throughout history, and we're astounded by the wealth of testimonies that sounded just like ours. To this day, we carry the weight of that encounter, forever changed by the knowledge that there are beings lurking in the shadows 
creatures from a realm beyond our comprehension. Our encounter with the reptilian creature serves as a chilling reminder that the boundaries of our world are far more mysterious and perilous than we could ever imagine. Naples, Florida, May 2014. The next encounter shows us that even though we think we know an area, there are creatures surrounding us that we never see. Creatures that hide and only show themselves on their schedule. It's safe to say that we need to always stay vigilant and to keep aware of our surroundings completely. The sun had been beating down mercilessly on John ever since he started his visit to the Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary in Naples, Florida. He had arrived a bit later than normal that day and quickly remembered why he liked visiting right when they opened. Because the mornings are cooler. He paused to take a drink from his water bottle and wipe the sweat from his brow, and he surveyed his surroundings. He never got tired of visiting the place, even though he had been coming at least once a month for the past few years. Sometimes he would even take a day off from his job as a utilities maintenance technician for the city of Naples, just to visit the swamp. His job required him to install, maintain, and repair pumps, motors, and electrical controls for various structures for city utilities. It was basically a lot of technical stuff that could be stressful. So visiting the sanctuary and being in nature periodically helped him to reset his head. This day, he was deep into the walk along the two-mile boardwalk, and he was now at the heart of it, in the bald cypress area where you had some of the best chances of catching glimpses of some animals that lived there. Many were elusive, and it was those that he challenged himself to find. In general, the sanctuary is home to many animals, including alligators, otters, eagles, and Florida panthers. But in the end, for most visitors, it's the massive cypress trees that are the main attraction. Some of the trees are over 500 years old, and they tower overhead creating lots of shade, and their thick roots create an eerie underworld in which anything could hide. With each visit, John said he was able to see something new that he hadn't noticed before. He even made it a challenge to spot something new. Most importantly though, he knew that if you timed it right, you could have the place to yourself. Although admittedly, there could be a creepy feeling to the place when you were alone out there. It almost seemed otherworldly with its strange plants, animals, and ancient trees growing in the swampy undergrowth. The land and the surrounding area was nothing like anywhere else in the world, with some of the ancient trees being over six feet in diameter and over a hundred feet tall. John looked out into the swamp trying to notice an animal hiding in the dense foliage and the underbrush. It was thick and lush where he stood, and it took a unique species to be able to live there, he thought. He remembers that the day was getting so humid that he could feel the sweat dripping down his back, and even watch droplets of water roll off the leaves around him. He also remembers thinking that something seemed different in the air that day, but he chalked it up to being extra hot and humid, more so than any of his previous visits and he wished he had packed more water. But he didn't want to head back just yet, and so he pushed through the heat and he continued to stand there and watch. Soon, a noise broke the silence. He heard a rumbling and rustling in the bushes off to the side, a noise that he hadn't heard before. His heart quickened as he got excited, thinking he would see an alligator or perhaps a Florida panther, or maybe even an animal that he hadn't ever seen before. He slowly took a few steps along the boardwalk towards the noise, trying to make no noise. At the same time, he reached for his camera, which was slung around his neck, and he brought it up to his eye, and he looked through the lens. What he saw made his heart drop. A massive, wolf-like creature standing about 20 feet from him. It was halfway hidden between one of the massive trees, but still visible through the camera lens. It was a huge, wolf-like creature, its eyes boring into him from the shadows. The creature was easily twice the size of any normal animal that should be in the swamp, and knowing that this thing was out of place, John knew he was in trouble. He dropped his camera from his face and stared at the creature directly with his eyes. 
not knowing what to do as the animal continued to stare at him. His heart was still pounding in his chest and he could feel the blood rushing through his veins and echoing in his ears. The creature made a jerking movement towards the boardwalk and John leapt back from the rail so hard that he bumped into the railing on the opposite side. With a sudden movement from John, the creature stopped but was still staring at him. John could see that it was definitely a wolf, or at least some hybrid type of creature with a large head and furry body, but it was unlike any wolf he had ever seen. And it was at least twice the size of a normal wolf, with its fur a mottled mix of gray and brown. It also had large, sharp teeth that were bared at him as it stared at him. The creature made another move towards John, this time more slowly, and stopped just a few feet from him just on the outside of the railing furthest from him. Thank God for the boardwalk and its railing, which was now the only thing between John and the creature. John could see its eyes now, and they were an eerie yellow color. No wonder they glared at him from the shadows the way they did, he thought. The wolf creature then sniffed the air before turning its head to look out into the swamp. John could see that it was sensing something, smelling the air to catch the scent of probably another animal. Whatever it was, John was just happy that the attention had been taken off of him. And then after a few minutes, the creature seemed to lose interest in John, who had just stood there, leaning, unmoving against the railing. And then the creature started to move away, walking away on two legs and disappearing back into the dense, shadowy growth from which it had come. John remained in the same spot for a long time, not knowing what to do or if it was even safe to continue along the boardwalk and back to the visitor center. He still hadn't seen anyone else, and his heart was pounding in his chest. Now, he even felt extra lightheaded and dizzy. He knew that if this creature was still nearby, watching him and deciding to attack, he would be dead in seconds. The strength and the power of it hadn't been lost on him. John's first instinct was to run, but he knew that he would just make it obvious that he was scared, and that could kick in the creature's prey instinct and make it more likely to attack. John's legs were shaking so badly he could barely stand, but he managed to get himself moving and to walk as normally as possible back to his car. It took 30 minutes to get back there since he was walking along at such a leisurely pace. But as soon as he got back to the Blair Audubon Center, which was the gateway between the swamp and the parking lot, He started to sprint, and then he ran the last few hundred feet to his car, not wanting to waste any time getting out of there. He got in his car, locked the doors, and just sat there for a few minutes, trying to calm himself down and wrap his head around what had just happened. He turned on the ignition, and he blasted the air conditioning, hoping that cooling himself down could help his head get back in order. He sat in the car for a few minutes, trying to calm his heart and thinking about what he had just seen. He knew he had to tell someone, but he wasn't sure who or how. After 20 minutes or so, he calmed down a bit, and with a clearer mind, he decided to go back to the main gate and tell the ranger there what he had seen, what had happened. Most of them recognized him from coming so often, so he told them, as calmly as possible, what had just happened. He showed them on a map where he had seen the creature. He told them they would definitely look into it. The ranger thanked him and told him that they would be in touch if they needed anything further. John went home that night, still shaken up from his encounter, but feeling better that he had reported it and that there would be a search party looking for the creature. In the end, the search party never found the creature, or at least, John never heard anything further from the rangers, and he never heard anybody else mention it again. But to this day, when he thinks about that day, And what he saw, he still can't quite shake the feeling that it's still out there, somewhere, waiting to be discovered, or waiting to discover him. This happened in the summer of 2007. I was a city worker for a town out on the East Coast. I don't want to drop any names since this really isn't something I should be talking about. The town I worked for was a pretty big tourist destination in the summer and fall. We were near enough to the ocean to bring in quite a crowd for the summer months. There was a decent-sized lake on the edge of town that was a frequent destination for tourists. However, 
That year, there had been some strange sightings around the lake. The first reports were of giant birds sitting on the water's edge, preventing people from entering the lake. And then the story changed to bird men, like humanoid figures with wings. No one ever saw these things up close. They would describe the silhouette of the creature as either a giant bird or a bird man. In all the stories, the creature had yellow eyes and would block people from getting to the lake. Sometimes it wandered around the lake. Sometimes it stopped cars along the road to the lake. But no one ever saw its face. It was so much of a problem that the police were called to investigate multiple times. The logical theories were that it was either a large territorial bird or some weirdo in a costume. The illogical theories were that it was either the Mothman, a bird-human hybrid, a ghost, or some kind of demon. I leaned towards the weirdo in the costume theory. That's what the two police officers thought as well when I talked to them about it. However, some further developments would take place that would make me change my tune entirely. It was getting late in summer and I had not yet seen the creature. The lake that was once a popular recreation area was practically empty. Whatever the creature was, it was doing a great job at scaring people away. It was terrible for the town that relied on the income from tourists, but I thought I would use the opportunity to take my two kids to spend some time at the lake. It wasn't often that we get the lake all to ourselves. It was about three o'clock when we left for the lake. Part of me wanted to see the creature because I was one of the few locals who hadn't. At this point, I was convinced that it was some person in a costume, so I wanted to see how believable the costume really was. It was deathly quiet when we got to the lake. That was the first thing I noticed. No sounds of birds, no frogs, no insects even. It was the strangest thing. I definitely felt that something was wrong, but it wasn't something I could quite put my finger on. I heard some rustling in the trees above me, but when I turned to look, there was nothing to be seen. I thought I saw a black shadow move past me, but I couldn't tell for certain. My kids just looked at me. They knew there was something going on here too, but they didn't say anything. We walked down to the edge of the lake, and that's when we saw it, the creature. It looked like the shape of a man, maybe five-ish feet tall, and it had wings where the arms should be. The creature was entirely black, its face and its body. But that was not the strangest part. It was standing in the middle of the lake, standing on the water, but it didn't have its wings raised. It was just standing there, like it was floating or something. I was so fixated on the creature that I didn't notice what was right in front of me. There were several dead fish floating in the water, and more fish had washed up on shore. A few dead songbirds were on the beach, too. There was something terribly wrong here. I took my kids and ran back to the car. We went out for ice cream and I didn't say another word about what we had seen. But since I work for the city, I did some digging when I got to work on Monday. I went back to the lake with a couple of co-workers and we ran some water quality tests. We did not see the creature that day, but I have no doubt that it was there somewhere. And here's where it gets even weirder, as if it wasn't weird enough. We found out that the local company was dumping some severely toxic waste in a river that fed into the lake. The pollution levels were off the charts, and it was poisoning the fish and the wildlife. It was a huge deal when the public found out, and it took a few years to finally restore the lake. The creature sightings continued to happen around the lake until the pollution cleaned up. I don't know exactly what the Birdman was, but I'm pretty sure it was there to warn people to stay out of the water. It disappeared after the lake was cleaned and restored, and we haven't seen it since. I was hesitant to tell my story because it sounds crazy, but I hear other people having encounters just like this, and I think that these things are not necessarily out to get us. They have some purpose, and if you ever see one, check your surroundings. It might be trying to tell you something. Tennessee Summer 2022. I'm not sure how to tell this story in any way that anyone will believe. As far as I know, I'm the only person to have ever come across this creature. 
Nobody I've ever talked to has ever heard of the thing, and I can't find anything online anywhere where it's run in with anyone else. I still know what I saw, though. I saw it plainly with my own eyes and in broad daylight, so there's no way I confused it with anything else. Let me back up a minute. I'm a longtime lover of your show, and I tune in regularly from my home in Arkansas. This story, though, takes place a little east of home on Real Foot Lake in the northwestern corner of Tennessee. I love to fish, and I was out on the lake one day last summer trying my hardest to hook a couple of big catfish. I wanted to catch them for a fish fry that I had promised my brothers, who had promised to come and visit me next weekend. The fish finder on my boat was telling me that there were several large fish swimming directly underneath me. So even though it was the hottest part of the day, and I was hungry and thirsty and about out of ice water, I wasn't moving until I had at least one or two caught. It was sweltering hot that day, and I was all alone out on the boat. In fact, I hadn't seen another boat in well over an hour by the time I saw what I saw. I grabbed the last bottle of ice water I had out of the cooler and I took a seat at the front of the boat. I casted out my line and sat quiet, waiting for a tug on the line. As I wiped the sweat off my brow, though, something came up and bumped the underside of the boat. It wasn't a hard bump, but hard enough to nearly knock me out of the seat, and definitely hard enough that I felt the need to scoot over and look down into the water to try to figure out what it was. At my first glance, I couldn't see anything. I gave up scanning the water for something big and I went back to my seat to take another swig of ice water. I figured it must have been a tree just underneath the water surface that I had passed over, or maybe one of those big catfish that were taunting me from down below. Just as I was almost sat back down though, there was another major bump under the boat. This time I dropped my water bottle, spilling the last of it out onto the bottom. As you can imagine, this made me frustrated, so I went back to the boat's edge to search again. This time, I was committed to finding the culprit, even if it was hard for me to see. I decided to grab one of the oars and push around under the boat a minute to see if I could get anything to come up. When I stuck the oar under the boat, though, something grabbed onto it tight, only for a second or two, and then I pulled the oar back up to find that the entire paddle of it was missing. Whatever was under my boat had bit the thing clear in two. This is about the time I decided to go ahead and start the motor to get the hell out of there. I couldn't imagine what it might be. My initial thought was that some Tennessee wacko had cut loose a pet alligator or something. The motor turned over only once before it died. I tried again, and it died again. The third time I couldn't get it to turn over at all. I pulled the propeller up out of the water to see if something was stuck, and I found that all of the blades were either broken off or bent. If it was an alligator down below, then it had skin as thick as concrete to do all that damage. I picked up my phone to call for help, and that's when the damn thing started to come up for air. Under my boat. And I'm not kidding you on this. There was a snapping turtle at least 15 feet wide. Well, it looked like a snapping turtle to me, but I'm not exactly sure what it was. Its head was about as big as my torso. I know this sounds ridiculous, but it was right there in front of me. I was so frightened that this thing was going to tip over the boat, and then it submerged itself back into the water, and the boat was about to tip over from the current of this thing submerging itself. I took out my other oar and I got myself to shore. It took me a while to work my way back to shore with only one oar and no motor. And keep in mind, it was hot as hell that day. I was so dehydrated by the time I got to shore. In the end, none of my friends believe me, but I swear that that is what I saw. Denver, Colorado, 2018. I was out camping with my buddies in the mountains outside of Denver. We were having a great time, sitting around the campfire, roasting marshmallows, and telling scary stories. Little did we know, we were about to experience something straight out of a horror movie. It was getting late one night, and most of us decided to turn in for the night. But my friend Jake and I decided to stay up a bit longer, 
and enjoy the peacefulness of the forest. We were sitting on some logs, chatting away, when suddenly we heard a rustling nearby. At first we thought it might be a small animal, so we grabbed our flashlights and went to investigate. As we approached the source of the noise, we started to feel a strange vibration on the air. The air felt heavy and an eerie silence fell upon the woods. And then out of nowhere, we saw it. It suddenly emerged from the shadows, this massive figure towering over us and getting taller with each step it took closer to us. Eventually, it was standing about eight feet tall on two legs, and it had a muscular body covered in fur that glistened under the moonlight. Its long pointed ears twitched as it turned its head towards us, revealing a face that sent chills down our spines. The creature had a snout that resembled a wolf with sharp fangs protruding from its mouth. Its glowing eyes pierced through the darkness, reflecting an intelligence that was unsettling to say the least. Its powerful, muscular frame exuded strength and agility, and as it took a step closer, we could see its clawed hands flexing. Fear gripped us, paralyzing our bodies. The creature emitted a low, guttural growl that resonated deep within our chests. It was a sound that seemed to vibrate through the very core of the forest, sending a wave of primal terror through our veins. Realizing that we were in imminent danger, Jake elbowed me to snap us out of our trances, and we then instinctively turned to run. But the creature was fast. It lunged towards us with incredible speed and its powerful strides were closing the distance between us. Adrenaline fueled our escape as we sprinted back to the campsite, shouting incoherently for the others to wake up. Confusion and panic spread among our friends as they stumbled out of their tents trying to grasp what was going on. I looked back and unbelievably did not see the creature, but there's no way I didn't believe it was still out there. I knew... 100% that it wanted us gone. I knew that it was watching us. Our friends saw the fear etched on our faces and the desperation in our voices, and without hesitation, they scrambled to pack up our belongings, no questions asked. As we hurriedly packed our tents and our gear, I could feel the creature's presence lingering in the shadows. It seemed to taunt us, and I was sure that I could see yellow eyes flickering from behind the dense foliage. Every rustle, every snapped twig sent shivers down my spine. It was as if the forest itself had come alive with malevolence. Finally, we jumped into our cars and sped away from what I now call that cursed place. Our tires kicking up dust from the dirt road. The relief we felt upon leaving that nightmarish scene was palpable but the memory of the creature's haunting presence remained etched in our minds. Finally, in the safety of our homes, we shared the entire details of our encounter with our friends, hoping to find some answers or validation from them. Some dismissed our stories just a figment of our imagination or a prank gone too far, but those who saw the terror in our eyes, the genuine trauma we carried, they knew there was something more to it. To this day, Jake and I can't explain what we witnessed. We've heard stories of similar creatures, cryptids that blend the characteristics of wolves and humans, but nothing can truly come close to what we feel having seen one for ourselves. I recently found a shocking secret about our government, and I've been wrestling with what to do with that information. At first, I decided to keep quiet because I don't want to be on their radar, but it's been weighing on my conscience. I think everybody needs to hear this. My father was career military, and he was hardly ever home when I was growing up. As a result of this, I never really felt close to him. When he was home, he always had this stern look about him, and he would shut himself away in his study most of the day. Mom always told me not to bother him, saying he was trying to rest. So I grew up with my dad, remaining kind of a mystery to me. I'm in my 50s now, and my mom has been gone for five years. Cancer. 
Since dad was all I had left, I tried to find some common ground in recent years. But things were always awkward between us. He didn't rebuff me, but he was so quiet when I came to visit, I would always wind up leaving sooner than I had planned, feeling like I was crowding him. Things went downhill with his health eight and a half months ago. He was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, and he didn't have much time left. I made more of an effort to be there, and he even opened up a little, telling me some stuff about his childhood that I never knew. Nothing important, but it was nice to have him talk to me like a normal dad, reminiscing about his past. I'm thankful that we finally bonded a little before he passed, 42 days ago. When Dad made the decision to spend his final days at home, I took a leave of absence from work so I could be there with him at the end. He was on morphine and in and out of consciousness for three days. When he was lucid, he seemed really sharp. His eyes focused and his words seemed to be chosen carefully. What I mean to say is the things he decided to tell me during this period were not ramblings of a man on drugs. He told me that there were things he had done in his life that he needed to get off his chest, things he wanted me to know before it was too late. My dad told me that he had been part of a secret government branch known as the 4E. The mission of this branch was to evaluate threats to U.S. citizens from unknown entities, eradicate those threats, and employ any means necessary to erase the incidents. So for 4E... Entity. Evaluate. Eradicate. Erase. He said if the citizens of this country knew what was living here among us, there would be mass anarchy. Rebellion against the government. Chaos. Stock markets would crash. Crime would surge. People's faith in God would take a toll. I disagree with that, by the way. But my dad said during his whole lifetime he stood by that philosophy doing things to protect our country and our way of life. So here are some of the things that he said happened. There's an underground base in Colorado that has several alien beings who were taken alive from a UFO crash in 1986. The government is trying to find a way to communicate with them. They're also testing their resistance to diseases that are a global concern. Dad said that he had seen one of the aliens himself He said it was kept drugged and locked in a lab. He described it as looking just like you see in those pictures. Grayish, short, skinny arms and legs, oval head, big eyes. He told me that they had to keep the creatures dosed up on something because they have mental abilities to manipulate solid structures. But he didn't elaborate on that. Dad also said the government is aware of the creatures that are hiding in the National Forest like Bigfoot and Wendigo. He told me it's assumed that they have been there since the beginning of time, and although over 6,000 had been eradicated between 1948 and 1999, the population is still thought to be pretty high, like upwards of 10,000, which is staggering to me. He said he had been called in several times to strong-arm park rangers who indicated that they wanted to make the public aware of these creatures. He personally had to threaten several park rangers with losing their jobs, and also had to imply that they would be prosecuted for treason if they went ahead and told. I think Dad felt bad about that part, because he went on about it for a bit, threatening the rangers, that is. The last thing he told me was that there was a creature that had escaped from a government lab in the 60s and adapted to life in the swamps and the sewers. He described it to me and it sounded like one of those rake things that people talk about. Humanoid, very pale, skittering around on all fours, big head, big black eyes and no nose, moving very fast. He said that one of the main concerns of the rake was that it preyed on human flesh. Apparently one had killed and partially eaten one of the doctors studying it when it escaped. So the population breeding in the wild was thought to be very real and a threat to mankind. I was totally shocked to hear all of this, but I tell you, looking straight into his eyes, I knew he was telling me the truth. He was totally lucid. 
Dad was afraid to say anything until he was on his deathbed, but he was so worried about these creatures as threats to human life. He didn't want me anywhere near the wilderness of this country, telling me it's unsafe. He said that there are thousands of disappearances in the national parks that are hushed up when the 4E comes in and deems one of the creatures responsible. If a body is found and the story leaks before they can cover it up, they say it was a bear or a mountain lion. But if it's just a disappearance and they think it was one of the creatures, they cover it up and the story never gets publicized. So I hope I'm doing the right thing. I know my dad wrestled with the right and wrong of telling, but lately, all I can think is, the truth is always the right way to go. May he rest in peace. As a park ranger at Yosemite National Park, I've always had a deep love and respect for the natural world. There's something about the majestic mountains, cascading waterfalls, and diverse array of wildlife that I just love. But lately, I've had a feeling that something is off here. It's hard to explain, but it's like a nagging feeling in the back of my mind that something is not right. I've tried to brush it off as just my imagination, but the feeling persists. I was on my usual rounds one day, checking on the various hiking trails and making sure everything was in order. As I was walking through the dense forest, I heard a strange noise. It sounded like a cross between a growl and a snarl, and it seemed to be coming from just ahead of me on the trail. I cautiously approached, my hand hovering over my radio, prepared to call for backup. As I peered through the trees, I saw something I could not explain. It was a creature that was unlike anything I'd ever seen in the park, let alone anywhere. It was covered in thick, shaggy fur and had a lupine head and glowing red eyes. Its body was muscular and powerful, and it stood on two legs like a human. But there was something off about it, something almost otherworldly. I froze, unsure of what to do. I'd heard of strange sightings in the park before, but I had always assumed that they were just hoaxes or the result of people seeing things in the shadows. But this was different. This creature was real, and it was right in front of me. I slowly backed away, trying to keep my movements slow and steady so as not to startle the creature. But as I turned to run, it let out a deafening roar, and it lunged at me. I sprinted back down the trail, my heart pounding in my chest. I knew I had to get to safety and alert the other rangers. I radioed for backup and headed back to the visitor center as quickly as I could. When I arrived, I was panting and out of breath, but I managed to get out a garbled explanation of what I had seen. The other rangers looked at me with skepticism, but I could see the fear in their eyes. They knew that if what I was saying was true, it could be a major problem for the park. We decided to send out a team to investigate and see if we could find any trace of the creature. I volunteered to go despite my own fear, I had to know what this thing was and how it had come to be in the park. We searched the area intensely where I'd seen the creature, but we found no sign of it. We searched for hours, but it was like trying to find a needle in a haystack. And then as the sun began to set, we called off the search and headed back to the visitor center. I was exhausted and disheartened, but I knew we couldn't give up. We had to find out what this thing was and stop it from affecting the park. Over the next few days, we searched intently. I know it's impossible, but it sure felt like we searched almost every inch of the area where I was. But we still didn't find any trace. It was like it never even existed. But I knew what I had seen. I knew that it was real, and I couldn't shake the feeling. So then as the weeks went by, the feeling only grew stronger. And then one night, I heard the same growl that I had heard before, but this time, It was coming from outside my cabin, and it was louder and more menacing than ever. I knew that I had to act fast. I grabbed my flashlight and my radio, and I stepped outside, ready to face whatever was out there. And that's when I saw it again. The creature was back, and it was even more terrifying to me than before. It was too close now, too close for comfort. Its eyes glowed red in the darkness and its fur bristled as it let out its deafening roar. 
but this time I was prepared. I shone my flashlight directly into its eyes, hoping to blind it temporarily. And as it stumbled backwards, I grabbed my radio and I called for backup. Within minutes, the other rangers arrived, and we were able to surround the creature with the intentions of capturing it and securing both it and the park. However, it put up a fierce fight, one that took over an hour of intense teamwork on our end. And in the end, we were unfortunately unable to contain it. The creature overpowered us and took off back into the wilderness. All we could do was watch as it headed away. The safety of the park is still a concern, though. We did inform our supervisors, and they assured us that they would take the proper steps to ensure the park was not a danger. However, since that day, I've heard no further updates. And when I ask, I'm just told that things are being taken care of. I'm not sure what will happen going forward, but I'm happy to know that it was my intuition telling me that something was wrong in the park, and it was up to me, as a park ranger, to do something about it. To be honest, that's what keeps me going. West Virginia, 2002. I'm going to tell you about the strange events that happened in my small town. It all started on a summer evening in June of 2002. Our town, which is nestled amongst the rolling hills of West Virginia and surrounded by dense forests, was known to be peaceful. The locals were friendly, and life seemed to flow at a relaxed pace. However, little did we know that everything about that summer was about to change. I was a young kid at the time, about 12, and so I spent most of my days playing outdoors with my friends. We would often explore the woods, looking for hidden treasures or secret hideouts. But one day, we overheard the adults whispering about strange sightings in the area. They talked about a creature from local lore known as the Mothman, a mysterious being with large red eyes and black wings. At first, we didn't think too much about it, but the stories persisted and curiosity got the better of us. So we started listening more and more. Eventually, we got so interested and naively decided to take off on an adventure to figure out the truth behind the Mothman. That evening, as the sun was setting, we gathered near an old oak tree at the edge of town. We each told our parents we were headed to a different friend's house. Armed with flashlights and excitement and fear, we ventured into the nearby forest. The dense leaves cast eerie shadows, and the rustling created an atmosphere that scared us all to death. But at the time, we were too chicken to tell each other how scared we were. We treaded cautiously, our eyes scanning the surroundings for any signs of the creature. The wind was wisping through the trees, and every crackle of a branch made us jump. That night, we only searched for 15 minutes or less, all telling each other we were tired when really we were terrified. Little did we know that our encounter was eventually going to become a chilling reality. As days turned into weeks, the reports of Mothman stories even sightings in our town continued to grow. People claimed to have caught glimpses of its silhouette soaring through the moonlight sky, its eyes glinting ominously. The atmosphere in the town was mixed with fear and fascination, and we kids couldn't help but overhear all of the conversation. One evening, while sitting on my porch and looking up at the sky, I noticed a peculiar movement near the town's abandoned mill a dark figure emerged from the shadows, its wings outstretched resembling a giant moth. My heart raced, and I realized it was the Mothman. I ran in the house and called my friends. We all made a plan to head to the old mill. As we cautiously approached the area, we all started to hear and feel a loud humming, sort of a buzzing sound. We stopped and looked, and before we knew what was happening, we watched as the Mothman took flight from a tree off to our right. Its powerful wings created a gust of wind that made it difficult to stand, and we watched in awe as it circled above us, its eyes glowing eerily in the moonlight. It seemed to be watching us, studying our every move until flying off into the distance. The sight was completely terrifying, leaving us horrified 
and knowing that without a doubt, we should not have come here. We all ran back to our respective homes as fast as we could. From that night forward, our town was plagued with unexplained phenomena. Strange lights flickered in the sky. Eerie sounds could be heard through the night. People reported vivid nightmares, and they were increasingly becoming afraid to go outside. Driven by a mixture of young stupidity, determination, and fear, my group of friends and I then devised a plan to find the Mothman. So we gathered at the outskirts of town. The moon was high and bright, casting a strange glow on us as we prepared to face the creature. As we ventured into the forest, our hearts were pounding. The atmosphere was heavy with anticipation. And then we saw it. The Mothman emerged from the darkness with its wings spread wide, filling the air with a sense of foreboding and almost death. Summoning every ounce of bravery within us, we chanted for it to leave, hoping we could call it away, banish the creature. It screeched, flickering in and out of our sight, and it felt like we were fighting a battle between light and darkness. The air crackled with energy and the wind howled through the trees as if nature itself knew what was happening. And then with a final surge, the creature let out a haunting cry, flapped its wings, and retreated. Slowly, we watched as it faded into the night, leaving a silence behind. To this day, our small town carries the scars of what happened that June. People still tell the story of the Mothman to new generations to remind them that there's a balance between what we know and what we don't. I'm not sure that what my group of friends did was what actually made the Mothman leave, but either way, we like to think that we had some part of it. Just remember, sometimes the most extraordinary and terrifying experiences can teach us the most valuable lessons. Bowling Green, Kentucky, September 1997. In the fall of 1997, a girl went missing in my town. I was 24 at the time, and my brother was a volunteer firefighter. He asked me to be part of one of the search parties the town organized to look for her. We spent days sweeping parks, abandoned lots, and the forests around town. As the days passed, the search parties got smaller, but I stayed with it, as did most of the people on my crew. We did second sweeps of the deeper forested areas, knowing that she would be harder to find out there. With fewer of us out there, we broke off alone, but we were usually within yelling distance of each other. And we also had walkie-talkies. One afternoon, about an hour before dusk, I spotted some weird marks. I was keeping an eye out for footprints, either child-sized ones or adult ones that might mean someone had brought her out here. But the tracks were not shoe prints. They looked like a bare foot, a huge footprint with marks at the toes, almost like claw marks. But the shape was decidedly human, and there were only two prints. Someone was walking upright, so it couldn't be an animal. I called another crew member over to take a look, and he was just as confused as I was. Since we couldn't rule out that they were human, although they were weird, we followed them. We followed them for what felt like miles into the woods. It was getting late and dark, but we didn't want to lose the marks overnight, in case it rained and they washed away. So we radioed for help and got one other person, an older guy in the department. He seemed even less convinced about the footprints, but agreed to follow them with us. At dusk, the footprints are definitely harder to see, even with flashlights. We had to slow down and search carefully. It was starting to seem less likely that someone had carried the girl this far, but we weren't ready to give up on the only lead that we had had so far. While we were stumbling around in the near dark, we started hearing strange sounds. Someone, or something, walking and stepping on twigs and dry leaves. We called out, thinking that it might be another member of the search party, but no one answered. We swung our flashlights around, but we still didn't see anything. Sounds continued, and I thought about the marks. Whoever left them might still be out there with us, and it could be someone dangerous considering the circumstances. The three of us stood back to back, looking into the forest. I had a small knife with me, and the flashlights were heavy duty. 
but they weren't exactly any kind of a weapon. Finally, we saw a shape approaching. It was just a tall shadow walking towards us, slowly and awkwardly. We called out some more, asking the thing to identify itself, but it didn't answer. And as it got closer, I noticed that the shape was all wrong. This thing was wider than a human, and the head was way too big, and it was slightly hunched over, and the legs were bent backwards, almost like a dog, although he was walking upright. We pointed all three flashlights at the thing and pretty quickly could tell that it was not a man. Also, that it had almost certainly made the tracks that we were following. It was on two feet and had a vaguely human shape, but the rest of it was some kind of canine, especially the chest and the head. It was covered in thick fur and its face looked more dog than human. It had a pointed face and ears that stuck straight up. Its mouth was open and saliva dripped from its very sharp looking teeth. It slowly stepped towards us, never looking away, staring straight into our eyes. The eyes were glowing faintly in the dark. We backed away as it advanced, moving back the way we had came. It didn't change its pace and neither did we. At least until it howled and lunged and then we took off running. It took us a long time to get out of those woods. It was dark. We were panicked. We got lost a few times. Occasionally one of us would think that we saw the creature and we would start running again. It was absolute chaos, actually. Eventually we made our way out of the forest and we called the police. While we waited for them to arrive, we planned what we would tell them. All we could agree on was that it was some kind of half-man, half-dog beast. But we knew that that would sound ridiculous, and no one would believe us. So we planned on saying that we had just followed human footprints deep into the forest, and that we believed that the person who took the little girl had made them. The police obviously arrived, and they agreed to send a team the next day, and to follow our instructions to where we had lost the footprints. After a full day's search, though, they returned, saying that they couldn't find anything suspicious. They also didn't say anything about a dog creature either. And two days later, the girl was found alive. She had wandered off and gotten lost in the thick trees. It was a miracle that she was even alive, especially when I think about what we saw. We made some general reports to animal control about a wild dog in the woods, but they didn't take that very seriously. And to this day, I can't explain what I saw in there and how that girl survived, but I've never gone back in those woods, and I never will. Two of my friends and I were headed to Grafton Lake State Park in New York on a Sunday evening in the summer of 2005. We were on summer break from college and were going to camp that night nearby and head into the park and over to the lake in the morning. We were trying to get there in enough time to set up camp before it got too dark. I remember it was around 5 o'clock at night. We had the windows down and were enjoying the scenery as well as celebrating the end of the day since we had all worked that day at our respective summer jobs. All of a sudden, my friend sitting in the back seat yells behind me, What was that? I looked at him and he had his head tilted out the window, staring out into the woods and pointing. I looked out my window in the direction he was pointing and I saw this large, bipedal creature running through the woods, its image flashing in my mind as it ran and flickered behind the trees. It was hard to tell exactly how far away it was because the thing seemed huge. I would put it at about seven feet or more and about 50 yards or so away. One thing about it that really confused me was the way it ran. It was very odd. It seemed to be running on two legs, but its arms were swinging back and forth like the way a human would run, and its head was bobbing up and down as it ran, which made me think that maybe it was chasing something and trying to keep its eye on some kind of prey. I had never seen anything like this before, so my mind started racing with all of the possible explanations of what I could have been looking at. We sat there staring out the window for about 10 seconds or so, trying to make sense of what we had just seen when suddenly from behind us came this loud bang and it shook the entire car. 
My friend who was driving slammed on the brakes, and we all turned around to see that the back window of the car was shattered. But there was no reason for that to have happened. We weren't near anything that could have caused it to break. No falling trees or flying rocks, and there was no wind outside. I remember being terrified and thinking how weird it was that we simultaneously were looking at this strange animal, and at the same time our back window basically explodes. I looked again into the trees, but super scared of actually seeing anything again. But it was gone. Worse yet, I kept thinking about how the sun was starting to go down, and we knew that it would get dark very quickly after that. My friends and I were totally unable to make sense of what was happening, so we decided to just drive up a little further before we checked anything out, in case whatever we had been looking at came back out again. We definitely did not want that to happen. We drove maybe another quarter of a mile up the road before pulling over to the side and getting out of the car and assessing the damage. The back window was completely shattered, but there were no pieces of glass inside the car because the window was still sort of intact. I guess that's a safety thing on cars. Looking at the windshield all cracked like that, it was a big awakening to us, even though I think we probably had it in our minds that we could originally continue on to the campsite we unanimously decided that it was best if we just drove back home and forgot about the whole overnight thing. So we turned the car around in the middle of the road and headed back down towards where everything had taken place. We had no choice but to go back that way if we wanted to go home, unfortunately. So then as soon as we got back to the area where we saw the creature, my friend yelled, there it is. I squinted and looked up ahead of us into the trees, but there was this huge rock on the side of the road. I originally thought that he had meant he had seen the creature again and was yelling about that. But he said, no, look at the rock. That's what hit us. We stopped the car to look at it. The rock was huge. No one could have ever lifted that thing that I knew of and thrown it the way it came at us. We all just looked at each other in disbelief, but quickly continued driving away. We didn't say much to each other after that. We were all in shock. Honestly, the rock looked like it could have weighed 100 pounds and it would have had to have been hurled from quite a distance. So thinking about the thing that we had just seen moments earlier made me believe that whatever it was, was stronger than I wanted to think. I mean, to be able to pick up that rock and throw it at our car? As I was thinking about all of that, suddenly to our right, something in the woods caught our attention and we all yelled. We were definitely on edge. We quickly turned our heads in the direction to see what it was, but we were sure to keep the car going this time. And again, we saw the huge creature, and it appeared to be bipedal and running on two legs, just like the first time. But this time it was darker outside, and we could now see large, glowing eyes. And again, its arms were swinging back and forth as it ran. Obviously, we had never seen anything like this before this day, and now twice. So our minds were racing with the possible explanations, our brains were trying to make logical sense out of all of it. But whatever it was had already disappeared back into the woods again. This time, there was no doubt in anyone's mind that whatever we had seen both of these times was definitely not human. There was no stopping us from going home now. We drove as fast as we could down the road. We didn't want to be near those woods at all. And I'm pretty sure that whatever was in there obviously did not want us there or anywhere in the area. As we drove away, I couldn't help but wonder what else might be out there in those woods waiting to be discovered, or if there were more than one of what we saw. Because thinking of how that rock came at us from behind, I sort of think there was more than one. When we got home, we didn't tell our parents or anyone else what had happened. I personally was scared and didn't want to be made fun of or ridiculed by anyone. But I still think about that day. I think about it often. And I wonder. I've never seen anything like it since, thank goodness. But I can say with 100% conviction that whatever it was was definitely not a human figure. Do you think that there are creatures like this? Like this one, waiting to be discovered? What do you think this creature was? Please let me know so I can get some rest. Sierra Nevada Mountains, California, 2022. It was the summer of 22, and I'm up in the Sierra Nevada mountains in California, a place that I'd been looking forward to hiking for, like, forever. 
I had driven in from Colorado, and this was it for me. A hike of a lifetime. I had prepared all my gear the previous night, double-checking everything. Water, food, tent, map, the whole shebang. I was just itching to get out there and explore. So there I am, bright and early, ready to hit the trail. The sun's peeking up over the horizon, and it's just so serene. Anyway, a few hours into the hike, I stop to refuel, take a bit of a breather. I find this little nook near a stream, and I tell you, it's the perfect spot. Birds chirping, water gurgling. So I'm settling down to eat, and I hear this sound. At first, I think it's probably a squirrel or something. They're pretty common around here. I had already seen a ton of them. But then the sound gets louder and heavier. Suddenly I'm on alert, I'm no stranger to wildlife, and I instantly knew that this was different. I can just feel it in my gut. So I decide to move towards it and check it out. I tread lightly, trying to figure out the source of the sound, and then I see it. This creature. Now it's not a bear, not a mountain lion, not anything that you would expect to see in the mountains out here. It was something different. This creature stood on its hind legs like a human, but was much, much taller. The body was covered in these scales, like a lizard's. But these were larger, almost like armor plating. It was also a dark green color, almost black in some places. And its limbs were muscular, but lean, like a runner's, but way more powerful. And then the head was the most, let's say, striking part. It had these slanted, almond-shaped eyes that glowed this eerie yellow. It didn't have a snout or anything, more like a flat face. But there were these slits where a nose should be. And the mouth was filled with these sharp, jagged teeth. But they weren't like predator's teeth. More like rows of serrated knives, if that makes sense. Now, I didn't see any wings or anything, but it had a long tail, almost as long as the body and that used the tail for balance, I think, kind of how a kangaroo does. The hands, or claws, I guess, they were different, too. It had four fingers, but they were long and ended in these sharp, curved claws. But the thing I remember the most, the thing that really sticks with me, is the way that the thing moved. It was so, so smooth, like water flowing over rocks, almost graceful. Now you're probably thinking I'm pulling your leg or messing with you, but I swear this is exactly what I saw. So I just spotted this reptilian creature, right? This is some next level, out of this world kind of thing I'm telling you. But I had a good five minutes or so to just stare at the thing. So I'm there staring at this beast and it's standing there at the edge of the clearing just observing me. Like it's trying to figure me out. But here's the weird thing. The creature did not seem hostile. I mean, it was freaky as hell, sure, but it wasn't making any moves to attack or anything. So I take a step back real slow. I don't want to provoke it, but instead of coming at me, it just kind of, well, it mirrored me. As I moved, so did it, in the exact same way. It was like we were doing some weird kind of a dance. I know it sounds nuts, but it was as if the creature was just as curious about me as I was about it. We stood there for what felt like hours, but I'm sure it was just a few minutes. And at one point I could swear it made a sound like a low hum or something. I couldn't make much of it, but it didn't seem threatening. And then just as suddenly as it appeared, it turned and disappeared. Just like that. I tell you I was in shock. I mean, what was that? What did I just witness? So now at this point, there I was, alone in the clearing with my heart pounding like a drum. I'm just standing there thinking, did this really just happen? So after a few minutes of just standing there, trying to process everything, I decide to follow where the creature went. I couldn't just let it go, and I had to know more. Wouldn't you? So as I moved closer to where it disappeared, I noticed these huge tracks on the ground. Not anything I had ever seen in any guidebook. And in the air, it felt different too. Almost electric. 
It felt charged, and there was this energy around that I just can't explain. I pushed through the undergrowth following the tracks. It felt like I was in some kind of a dream or a movie. Like at any moment, I would just wake up back in my tent and it would all be over. But no, this was real, and it was actually happening. So as I walked further into the woods, I noticed that the tracks became harder to find. And then they started to disappear completely. It was like the creature had just vanished into thin air. I must have looked around for an hour or more, but there was no other sign of it. It was gone. But I swear to you that every time I closed my eyes that night, I could see it. Those eyes, the form, it was like it was burned into my memory. I still can't believe what I saw that day. I mean, who would, right? But that's the thing about nature. It never fails to surprise you. Denali National Park, 2015. So, picture this. I'm up in Denali National Park in Alaska. The last frontier. Nature at its most raw and its most real. I'm there on this solo expedition, just me in the wild. But man, I had no idea what I was getting myself into. So I'd set up my campsite near a stream. And after a long day of hiking... All I wanted was to soak in the peace, maybe catch a glimpse of some wildlife. Little did I know, wildlife was going to catch a glimpse of me first. The sun was beginning to dip behind the mountains and the temperature was dropping fast. I mean, it was Alaska after all. I was tucking into my dinner when I heard it. A low growl, just on the edge of my hearing. Now I've been out in the wilderness a fair amount, so I know what bears sound like. But this? This was different. Deeper. Almost guttural. And it was getting closer. I could feel the hair on the back of my neck standing up like static electricity in the air. And then suddenly there was a crashing sound, like something big tearing through the underbrush. I could see it just on the edge of the light from my fire. Barely more than a shadow. But, oh man, was it big. Like, bigger than any grizzly I had ever seen. Its eyes, they were glowing in the firelight. Not like a normal animal's eyes either. You know, reflecting light. No, these were bright. Almost like they were producing their own light. And they were locked onto me. At this point, I was so scared I could barely move. I mean, what was I going to do? I was in the middle of nowhere. Night was falling, and there was this, this thing, just beyond the light of my fire. I couldn't take my eyes off of it. It was like I was frozen in place. But then the thing moved and stepped into the light, and I could finally see it. Man, I wish I hadn't. It was like nothing I had ever seen before. Bigger than a bear standing on its hind legs like a human. But the face, the face was all wrong. It was canine, like a wolf, but wrong, twisted. So there I was, facing down this thing. I mean, it was like something out of a horror movie. And the eyes, the glowing eyes, they're burnt into my mind, even now. It was just staring at me, not making a sound, with its breath misting into the cold air. And I could see every ripple of muscle under its thick fur. And that's when it dawned on me. This thing wasn't just big, it was powerful. And then, as if it was reading my mind, it flexed its claws. And I'm talking claws like you would not believe. Like something out of a nightmare. I remember thinking, man, those could rip me apart without breaking a sweat. I was stuck there, right? On the one hand, my brain was screaming at me to run. But on the other, I knew that that would be a death sentence. You don't turn your back on a predator. Not unless you want to become dinner. And then the thing growled. Not like a dog growl. Not like a bear growl. This was something else entirely. It was deeper. More resonant. It filled the air and it made the hairs on my arms stand on end. Now I'm not a superstitious or religious guy, but in that moment I found myself praying. Praying to anything and everything that would listen. Because I knew... I just knew that I was in serious trouble. 
I don't know if it was my fear or the cold or what, but time seemed to slow down. I could see every breath I took, see the flicker of the firelight on the creature's fur. It was surreal like a dream, but way too real. Suddenly the creature tilted its head almost like it was curious, and then it sniffed at the air through its huge nostrils. I watched them, flaring. I thought this was it. I was done for. I mean, how could I not be, right? But then just as suddenly as it had appeared, the creature turned and disappeared into the night. I was left there, shaking and alone, with only the dying embers of my fire for company. I didn't sleep a wink that night, or the next, or the one after that. Even now, back in civilization, I can't shake the memory of that creature. Its eyes glowing, its terrifying growl, and the sheer size and power of it. I've told my story to a few people, but most don't believe me. They say it was probably just a bear or a trick of the light, but I know what I saw. I know what's out there, in the wilds of Denali National Park. So here's something wild for you guys. This happened to me a few years back, and I swear to this day, it still has me all kinds of twisted up. I've been listening to some of the stories here, and it's just wild how many folks have had these out there experiences. Makes me feel less like I'm losing my mind. Now, I've always been a city kid, born and raised in New York City, but I've had this lifelong fascination with the ocean. I always loved the water, the fish, all that stuff. Right out of high school, I figured I'd take a year off before heading to college and just travel around and see some of the world. Maybe get a bit of that ocean action I had been craving. A lot of my buddies were planning to study business or computer science or something. But that was never my scene. I was all about the outdoors, the wild and free, you know. So I'm doing this road trip down the coast, just me and my beat-up old car, and I hit Florida. Man, it was like a dream. The sun, the sand, the sea, the whole deal. That's when I found out about this thing they have, these marine conservation volunteers. Basically, you get to spend your day out on the water helping take care of the ocean. It was right up my alley, so I signed up without a second thought. Turns out, I was pretty good at it. I had a knack for the work and the ocean. It felt like home. After my year was up, I decided to stick around. I got myself trained up and I ended up landing a gig as a marine conservation officer. It was like a dream come true. Now a big part of the job was keeping an eye on the local marine life. Dolphins, manatees, even sharks. And don't even get me started on the sea turtles. It was awesome. I'd start my day about sunrise, head out to the boat, and just cruise, watching the water and keeping an eye out for any trouble. So one morning, I was out on the boat, and I saw something weird. There were a bunch of seagulls squawking and flapping around, which isn't that unusual, but they were out in the middle of the water, nowhere near the beach. It was weird enough that I decided to check it out. As I got closer, I saw that they were hovering around this big patch of seaweed. Now seaweed out here isn't anything to write home about, but this was different. The seagulls were going nuts over it, diving down and pecking at it like something was in there. I decided to get a closer look, and that's when I saw it. This thing just kind of blended in with the seaweed. It was huge with this big round head that looked almost fishy. It was bald, no hair, just this shiny, scaly skin. It was standing upright in the water, and I swear it must have been six or seven feet tall. It was a ways off, but I could see it clear as day. It had this dark, grayish skin like a shark, and when it turned to look at me, I nearly fell out of the boat. This thing had these big, yellow eyes, like a cat's, and these sharp, pointed teeth, and when it saw me, it sort of shifted, like it was surprised that I had seen it. I've never been so scared in my life. I could feel my heart pounding in my chest like it was just about to burst open. And I felt this heavy dread, like something bad was about to happen. I don't know how to explain it. It was like a weight pressing down on my chest. For a few seconds, I was just frozen there, staring at this thing. 
And then I don't know what came over me, but I decided to just get the hell out of there. I turned the boat around and I gunned it. I did look back once, and I saw it. It was moving away, diving under the water faster than any animal I've ever seen. I did end up calling it in, and a couple other officers showed up. They wanted to go out and check it out, but by then, the thing was long gone. They didn't even believe me, of course. Tried to tell me it was just a manatee or a big shark or something. But I know what I saw. Man, just thinking about it still gives me the creeps. I have no idea what that thing was, or what it was doing out there. All I know is, it was no ordinary creature. I still work out on the water, but let me tell you, I have never looked at the ocean the same way again. New Mexico, 2021. I know that this last summer I encountered something paranormal and out of this world, but I'm not exactly sure what it was. My friend and his family are convinced it's a skinwalker, but I believe it was something else. I do know a little bit about skinwalkers and dogmen and Bigfoot, too. And I don't believe that what I encountered was everything that matches up to what a skinwalker is. My friend's family thoroughly believes that this was the spirit or being that represents a skinwalker. I believe it was some other cryptid, or potentially, at least, the spirit of one. Last July, I went and visited a close friend of mine who's native and lives on the Navajo Reservation in New Mexico. We've been friends for years and we met during a work retreat long ago. I thought I'd make a vacation out of it by going to visit him. I stayed with him at his trailer for about a week or so and then we went to visit his family. His family is very enriched in Navajo culture and lore and his mother especially can be very superstitious at times. But as of this event, I don't blame her for anything she believes or doesn't believe, or so I thought. My Navajo friend never really talked about skinwalkers or cryptids or anything like that. I guess I can't blame him since it's part of this culture not to talk about those things in fear of drawing them to you. I truly don't know how he felt about all that stuff because, well... He never really talked about it. When he met his family, which this was the first time, they're very nice and lovingly invited me into their home. His mom pulled me aside and warned me of her brother that had turned to the darker side of things and would sometimes appear around at night just to start trouble. I didn't really understand what she meant by that, and at the time I thought she was just referring to him being drunk or something, causing drama, so I left it at that. It's not like I haven't encountered my fair share of bumps before. I never really asked my friend about his family or anything like that. So to my knowledge, my friend's uncle was nil. We stayed there for a few nights and everything was as normal as you can get. On one of the nights, all of us were outside having a bonfire, talking, laughing, eating good food, just like we had the nights before. Then after a short time, my friend and his family began to get really quiet, and the laughing, good times and all, turned into a serious, stoic expressions on their faces. It was in that moment that I remember I could feel a shift in the mood and the tonality around us. I don't know how else to describe it to you, but that's the best way I can. My friend and his family spoke together in Navajo in hushed tones, and I didn't understand a drop of that language. So I kept trying to interpret the tone and the demeanor as to what they were talking about. After everybody got quiet, my friend started talking to his family, and they're very concerned. It was almost as if they were trying to conceal their voices from maybe not only me, but something else. My friend turns around and walks up to me and says, you need to go back inside the trailer right now confused I thought we were having a good time but he just keeps walking to the trailer and quickly keeps motioning for me to follow him so I kind of just shrugged my shoulders going along with whatever was happening his dad was trying to put the fire out quickly and his mom was rushing both me and my friend into the house we got to the house and his mom kept looking out the window waiting for the dad to come back inside the father goes in grabs the gun 
and all the doors and windows are locked thoroughly. Now I'm starting to freak out just a little bit because I wanted to know what was going on. Normally you wouldn't have fires out here at nighttime for fear that it could draw in terrible, terrible spirits. But I guess in this case, looking back, they had their whole property and family and house blessed. So they had weekly bonfires. Well, more like nightly since they didn't have to worry about those things. Or so I thought. My friend comes up to me and whispers in my ear that his uncle is outside and that it's going to cause problems. I looked at him strangely and I asked if he was drunk and that did we need to call the police. And that's when I heard it's super loud banging on the trailer. The mom and the father both shrieked and the dad put his back up against the front door with a gun ready in his hands. At this point, I'm starting to freak the hell out because I don't know what's going on, but whatever it is feels ominous as hell. You could start to hear these heavy footsteps walking around the trailer outside and heavy breathing. It didn't sound human. Whatever it was, whoever it was, was pacing the trailer slowly as if looking for a weak spot to try and break in. That's what it felt like to me. And I was getting scared, terrified more likely. My friend and his family kept motioning to me to be quiet and just listen. And this went on for probably a good 45 minutes if I had to guess. But it's hard to say because sometimes it feels like it's an eternity when you're in the moment. After a while, things got quiet for another little bit of time. Dad looked at us all and said we needed to leave the house now to be safe. He motions for all of us to run outside and jump in the old van and flee. Me not knowing exactly what's going on, I'm kind of left with no choice but to just tag along and go with the flow. So, scaredy cat me runs out there with them and hops in the van. As his dad is basically throwing us in the back of the van, I hear the most horrifying screech or roar that I've ever heard from behind the trailer, just off a little ways in the darkness. It sounded like a mix of a bear crossed with a wolf crossed with a dying woman being murdered. It sounded like it came from the pits of hell. I think that was the point in the night where I truly felt fear go down my spine. I knew I was in danger. My friend and his mom were pale, and then she started to cry and pray in Navajo. His dad is swearing in Navajo. He's trying to get the van to start. I think it was an old beater van that had problems with the ignition and had issues starting up sometimes. I think I do remember at one point, though, my friend mentioned that they needed to have the whole engine replaced, but they didn't have the money. Anyway, he gets the van going and we're flying out of there onto the main highway. Now, at least at this point, remember it's nighttime. There aren't any lights around except for stars. And he's probably going close to 70 or maybe 80 miles an hour. He's flooring it, trying to get away from where we just were. And we are all quiet in the back. Nobody saying a word. And then my friend looks up and looks out the window of the back of the van, and he starts screaming and pointing and shouting at something. I look, and catching up with the van is the largest wolf I have ever seen. I guess I could call it that because it resembled a wolf, but it looked so much more evil. It's like a wolf that came from hell and had kind of a smoky vapor to it, if that makes any sense. I don't know how else to describe it, but it's almost like it had black smoke emanating from it. And it had glowing red eyes and large teeth like some sort of saber-toothed wolf or something. And it was massive. It was running on all fours and getting closer and closer to the van. We're all watching in horror, and then this thing just darts off to the right of the van and increases its speed to not only keep up with the van, but keep up on the driver's side window. And at this point, it's right next to the dad. He's still keeping up at 80 miles an hour. We are all screaming. And then his dad pulls off of a fork in the road that conveniently showed up. Thank you, Lord. Here, the road is a little bit more rough, but he decided to go down that way to try to ward off the thing or whatever was chasing us. While he starts going down this road, the next thing is that this thing just disappears. It's a more primitive road, but by primitive, I mean it still has concrete and stuff. It just isn't taken care of. 
so there are potholes and parts of the road that are severely cracked and damaged. So we go down this road for I don't even know how long, maybe an hour, but that might be a bit of a stretch. At one point, he just pulled over and parked the van in the middle of nowhere in the pitch black of night, and then he just sat there and started sobbing against the wheel. My friend and his mother didn't say a word. I'm not even sure what was going on. I'm trying to process what just happened, and there was some freakish demon wolf creature thing chasing the van. It was literally the size of a car. I kind of blacked out, to be honest. I felt like it was so traumatic that my brain just had to escape and register that I really wasn't in reality anymore. My memory's kind of fuzzy. So are the details. But I can tell you that we did sleep in the van that night. It wasn't comfortable. I can tell you that. But I think we were just so exhausted from sheer fear. I have no idea why it stopped following us and why his dad just pulled over on the side of the road, leaving us all vulnerable in my eyes. But whatever it was, we didn't see it after we pulled off. I remember opening my eyes and it was daylight, or at least just starting to see the sunlight come out with his dad standing outside of the van looking around. My friend and his mom were still asleep, and the dad then just hops back in the van, turns it on, and begins to turn back around to where their home was. I was exhausted and still terrified, but I didn't have the energy to ask what just happened. Somewhere along the way, my friend and his mom woke up, and we all just kind of sat there in silence, in trauma from the night before. At one point or another, we pulled back into their house. We were all getting out of the van, when the dad and the mom walk up to the house and start talking nervously again, praying, dropping to their knees. There were deep scratches all over the house and the door. It looked like Kodiak bears tried to maul their trailer. It was bad. My friend's trying to talk calmly to his parents as best as he can, and they're both so worked up that they can't even think straight. My friend comes up to me, pulls me aside, and tells me we should leave that it's not safe to be here, at least not anymore. I wasn't going to argue or try to ask questions. I just went along with everything, gladly. In the last 12 hours, I felt my life had flipped upside down entirely. We left and the rest of the visit was not the same at all. My friend had completely shut down and didn't speak much. Fast forward a little bit and I was able to finally talk to him about what had happened. This is where things get a little creepy and I'm really starting to connect the dots. Turns out that my friend's uncle, at a young age, murdered his little brother. Or in this case, my friend's mother's youngest brother, who at the time was a small child. This in turn caused him to be banished and he took and turned to dark magic, becoming a skinwalker. They had a name for it, a name that they call it, but I can't remember it basically a skinwalker. Her brother became animalistic in nature, living in the wild and turning to evil. He'd tried to come back time to time to torment his sister and my friend's family, taking the shape of hideous beings and other animals. This is why they believed him to truly be a skinwalker. However, it gets more terrifying than this. That night in July, when we experienced what we did, it was later found out that her brother, who had turned to evil practices, committed suicide in a satanic ritual of sorts that same evening. This led to further speculation that this was the actual evil spirit who dwelled in his mom's brother, that it had come to enact revenge on the family for banishing him years before. That's what he and the family believes now. Why it stopped following us in the van after some time is also another interesting story. I guess it just so happens that not too much further down the road from where his dad pulled off lived a medicine man in the community who had much of the area blessed and had warded off dark spirits before in the past. This friend of mine, who I won't name for his family's respect, claimed dark spirits were afraid of him and the pieces started to connect more and more as time went by. Myself, I'm not really sure what to think or believe. I know their entire culture is very enriched in that sort of thing of warding off bad spirits, but this was on a whole other level. 
I don't think spirits or demons, call them whatever you will, could take physical form like what I saw and chase down a van at 80 miles an hour. I do watch creepy pasta stuff and things on Dogman, Bigfoot, etc. So to see this in real life was more than terrifying. It was as if I was in a horror movie. I don't have an answer for you, but it caused me to shut down for a few weeks until I could finally talk about it with my friend and get some closure on what exactly happened and why. Maybe it was the spirit that dwelled in his uncle that came and attacked us. I have no idea. My friend and his family had prayed heavily for me in Navajo since I was there so as not to attract any more of these things. They firmly believe that once you have a sighting with one of these, you become marked for more encounters. His parents had had their house blessed multiple times before this happened in fear that her brother would return and seek revenge on her as he had tried before. My friend told me that this was the reason why this spirit or being wasn't able to enter their house because it had been blessed by that medicine man. I know that skinwalkers and dark spirits are very much a part of Navajo and are very real. I couldn't imagine what it'd be like dealing with these things, though, on a normal basis. Anyway, I know that whatever chased down that van for as long as it did possessed supernatural powers in its own right. And I know that no flesh and blood being alone, or at least even an animal, could have ever done that. <laughs> 